Welcome to my YouTube channel. My guest on Facing the Canon is Jennifer Rees Larkham, whose life and ministry is Beauty from Ashes. Jennifer Rees Larkham, welcome to Facing the Canon. Thank you for having me, but I'm very scared. <laughs> oh, Jen, I've wanted you on the program ever since the beginning. And there was one day you were going to come and yes. then the roads were blocked. Absolutely. You, it was you heartbreaking. It, you couldn't yeah. get here. Yes. But you're here yeah. today. Jen, that's wonderful. Yes. We're related because not only are you my wife's godmother, but you're also cousins with her father. Indeed, yes. Yes, our two fathers, well, her grandfather and my father were brothers. Brothers. Yeah. Now, your father, can we start there with your story? Your father was an evangelist. He was. His he was. name? Tom Rees. And he used to hold great big rallies in the Royal Albert Hall. In fact, he was said to have filled it 52 times. And he was the first person who invited Billy Graham to come over to this country. Amazing. He even stayed with us. And when I was a child, I thought he had the most gorgeous blue eyes. I fell in love with him oh. aged about seven. Yeah. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> and then also, uh, your parents ran a conference centre? They did, yes. They bought a great big tumble-down old mansion that had been disused during the war, and they turned it into the first residential Christian conference centre in the country. Yeah. So your life growing up, <laughs> yes. constantly in environments with lots of people. Oh, we had 200 a week staying with us, and a resident community of about 35 people. So it was a wonderful growing up, different, but very rich, yeah. And what about for you, Jen, when was your first encounter, personal mm. encounter or awareness of the Lord? Well, that was very vivid memory indeed, actually, because it was a very tumbling down mansion. And at age two, when I moved there, and I was really scared of the dark. It was a great big mansion and I was scared of mice and all sorts of creakings and groanings. And one night in the middle of the night, I woke up pitch dark, terrified. And my mother had always said, don't be afraid if you wake in the dark, Jesus is always sitting on your bed. And I'd never really believed her, but I thought I'd try it out. So inside a silent scream, <laughs> too scared to shout, just help me. And at that very moment, a bird began to sing out in the garden. And a cuckoo, we had cuckoos then, and lots of cuckoos and lots of birds. And I realized it was actually morning, but they had those thick blackout curtains from the war, so I couldn't see out. And I really actually thought that Jesus had sent the, the dog chorus just for me. <laughs> That's amazing. But then there's another beautiful story when you're in central London, yes. German street, yes. and your father had gone to maybe buy a shirt or a, a yes. suit, uh, and you're in the car with your mother. Tell us about that conversation. Well, I think it must have been quite soon after I discovered that Jesus was real. And I said to her, why do we have to have all these people staying with us every week? And she said, because they need to have Jesus living in their hearts and we help them to find him. So I said, well, I'm quite like that myself. So I asked him in and he's been there ever since. <laughs> that is amazing. So your, your mother led you in a prayer. Yes, she did. To receive Jesus. Yeah, Lord Jesus, come in today, come in to stay, come into my heart, Lord Jesus. Beautiful. And he did. He did. He did. I changed completely because I'd been terribly insecure and, and having tantrums and all sorts of panic attacks. But that stopped that very day and I never had another. He came with his peace, I think. Hmm. That's incredible. How old were you then? I was four. Not older than that. Not at school. And you're almost 80. <laughs> I am. 
and the Lord mm. has not left you. Never once. He was utterly faithful. I've had times when I've slipped away and been very angry with him, but he's always got me back. Yeah. And even those moments of discouragement and darkness, you've always been aware of him. Yes, yes, even if he was there to be cross with, if you know what I mean, yeah. Mm. Now, growing up, you, you got married, you then had to battle with an illness. Yes. Tell us about what, what happened. What were you battling with? Uh, encephalitis, which is an inflammation of the actual brain. And so everything was knocked out. And I, I was very seriously ill at the beginning, but it gradually over perhaps two years, I got a little bit of movement and stuff back. But it was a horrid time because I had six children. And how can you bring up six children from a sitting down position? Especially if three are very naughty boys, and they were. So it was a tough time. It was tough. Yes, it was. Now, you even wrote a book during that time called Beyond Healing. I did. After, Tell us about that. After about two years, I think the first two years were terribly frustrating because everyone at church was talking about healing and they gave me endless copies of books about healing and they sort of implied that if you had enough faith you would be healed or have you got some secret sin inside you or aren't you forgiving someone i did all those things i even had devils cast out of me but it didn't make any difference so i just felt rather hopeless i didn't go to church anymore because i thought he'd really let me down and then one day, one morning, on Saturday morning, I had a major row with my husband because he wanted to move into the middle of town. And I, I managed to get out of the house because I wanted to scream. So I tottered out on my elbow crutches. I wasn't quite in a wheelchair at that stage. And I tottered out and down the bottom of the garden, there was a dip. And all the, the, the cows in the next door field used to do horrible things. And it had been raining, so this little tip, absolutely full of liquid stuff. Yes. Horrible stuff. I won't tell you what I called it, but I did. But as Jesus said, what yes. goes in comes out. <laughs> absolutely. Yes. And I fell in it. I tippled right over. And of course, I didn't have enough strength in my arms and legs to get myself out again. And do you know what? I let God have it. I was so angry that he should let a mother of six have to be reduced to this. And I thought this stuff, and I called it something else, is actually what my life's got like. It was such a lovely life. And suddenly it's reduced to nothing but this. <laughs> and that was when I actually encountered him more than ever, ever, ever before. And I felt his love. I don't know that, even though I'd been brought up in a Christian home, that I'd ever actually realised he loved me. He loved all the clever people who came to stay with us, but not an ordinary person like me. And I realised he did. I felt his love. And I felt him say, um, no, I said to him, why haven't you healed me? You could have healed me. Yeah, I raged at him. And he said, I could help you if only you would let me into the center of the pain you're in. I think what we do when we're in pain and turmoil, we, we push God out because he's failed us. And, and, and the painful bit becomes the center of everything. Jen, what would you say to our viewers who are struggling now with disappointment, feeling angry with God, and with others, what would you say to them? I'd say I understand and I know, and actually God is big enough to take our anger, but he's the one source of hope and comfort that we have. So don't be cross with him as long as I did. Just ask him right into the middle of all that you're going through. I can promise you he will make a huge difference. Jen, would you pray for those people who are struggling with to. this now? I'd love to. So all of you who are difficult relationships and horrible things are happening to you, I want to pray for you. 
Lord Jesus, will you bless those lovely people? You can see them wherever they are sitting right now. You can see them. And I pray that just like you did in the gospel stories, you put your hand on people, reassured them and helped them. Would you do that now for these special people that you can see? Thank you. Amen. 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 As you said, Jen, you had to battle for several more years, <laughs> yes. but then something yeah. happened. <laughs> it surely did, yes. Go on, what happened? Yes, well, I, was, I, I often did go to speak at meetings. Somebody had to take me in my wheelchair and all that, but the minister's wife took me and we went to speak in a, in a not very far away from here, a place called Hazelmere. And it was full of ladies, it was a ladies' day. And I was speaking all about how you can find God in the bad places of life. And there was a girl in the front row and she suddenly sort of interrupted. And that sort of put me off my stroke a bit because it's, you don't know what's happening. And she said, can I ask you what was wrong with you? Why were you in a wheel? Why are you in a wheelchair? And as I explained about the cephalitis, and she said, well, I've only just become a Christian and, and I've been reading about Jesus in the Bible and he healed people. So why hasn't he healed you? There was a horrible, horrible hush in the room because everyone was thinking, oh, stupid girl. Because you don't say that sort of thing no. to someone in a wheelchair, do you? So I had a sense that actually she was right. He did want to heal me. I hadn't had that faith before. So at the end of the day, I went up to her in my wheelchair and I said, would you pray for me? Oh no, she said, I've never prayed out loud in my life. I couldn't do that. But I said, please do, because I think he'll listen to you. So she just put her both hands on my head, but they were shaking because she was so scared. And she just prayed this simple prayer, Lord Jesus, Jen's been ill for eight years. Please will you make her well now? I don't think she even said the amen. <laughs> and I was well. I knew I could stand up, which I hadn't done unaided for a very long time indeed. I stood up and the first thing I wanted to do was rush to the loo and there was a big toilet roll there and I squeezed it just to see if my hands would work. I squeezed it. I knew it was all right. Something had changed. And your muscles. Yes, that was the extraordinary thing. A few days later, I saw my, my usual physiotherapist and she said, I can't, I, I can't believe this. This is extraordinary. It would have taken me months to get this much muscle tone. Yes, because there was muscle wasted. Absolutely, wastage. absolutely. But yes. you managed to get up out of the wheelchair and walk. Yes. Next day, I went at five o'clock in the morning all around the park and had a wonderful walk. So when you got home, how did your husband and your family respond? My husband stalked off to the allotment and stayed there for the rest of the evening. He didn't want to believe and then find that it was not true and it was all something, you know, I was making up or something. So he, ha he was trying to process this. He was this. trying to process it. <laughs> but my, my son, he was about 12 at the time, uh, and he, he leant right back in his chair. He used to do that and it terrified me. He would break his back if he fell, but he used to rock back and forth. And he said, well, if God can do that kind of thing for you, mum, he can do anything. <laughs> Absolutely. He started coming to church with us after that. After that. <laughs> How did that change your life? Absolutely, utterly. But what I wasn't expecting was that, you see, because I'd written the books in the wheelchair and some of them have been bestsellers, yes. everybody wanted me to go to their church or to their meeting and, and tell people about it. So suddenly, after having been locked in my house for eight years, I was going all over the country. It was a strange change. Mm. You then wrote another book, Unexpected Healing. I did, and it was sure unexpected. 
<laughs> so, so you've got these two books, Beyond Healing and then Unexpected Healing. Yes, yes. <laughs> it was quite sad, really, because a lot of churches didn't ask me to speak anymore because they said, our church doesn't quite believe in that kind of thing, so we don't want you. It was really painful, yeah. that. It made a big difference to me. So, Jen, our viewers, those that are struggling now with ailments, afflictions, they are longing for a healing touch from Jesus. What, what would you say to them? Well, oh, how I know what you're feeling like. It is so frustrating. When you really have faith and you know that Jesus can heal, does heal, but yet he doesn't choose to heal you. I, I don't have any answers. I don't have any answers, but I do know that in that dark place, that's when he's most real. Reaching out to him and getting to know him in those hard times. <laughs> but when he does heal, it's pretty wonderful. And he really does do it very well. Mm. Can you pray for those oh, I should like to. Um, yes, brothers would, and sisters? I would truly love to pray for you if you're struggling with this whole question of healing. It's tough. I don't have answers. But I know that Jesus has. And whatever he's doing in your life now is going to be really good, even however hard it feels for you. And I'd love to pray for you. Dear Lord Jesus, Oh, Jesus, for those people that you haven't healed yet. I know you'll heal them one day when they see your face, but that feels a long way ahead, Lord. Oh, Lord, would you give them the gift of patience and peace, strength and courage right now where they are. May they use this dark time to know you better. Amen. 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 Well, Jen, that must have been a mountaintop experience. It was. But as you progressed and moved on in your life and ministry with Jesus, there were a few valleys. Oh, there were. Because and... I don't know that my poor husband could cope. He would so wonderful when I was ill. He was my carer, everything to me. But I don't quite think he could cope with a new me who bounced around and did things. And so he left. Yes. If I had my time over again, I wouldn't bounce around and I wouldn't speak at a single meeting. I would stay put and make him happy because I still love him. Yes. Mm. But you don't have your time over again, do you? No. And he didn't tell me he minded, he just went. Yeah. So how, d how did you cope during that season of your life? Badly, badly. For five years, I could not understand what God was doing. Now I said, I'll go back in the wheelchair any day you like if you just give me back my husband. But he didn't. He didn't. Now, five years later, he married someone else. So gradually, I think I came to see that he's just as good at mending broken hearts as he is at mending broken bodies. And in a way, that was the best thing that ever happened to me, although it was quite the worst and still is the worst. I longed for him to come back, but he does become the husband. He says in his, in his word that he'll be, your maker is your husband. I found that verse one dark night and I was so miserable. And he really has been the most brilliant husband to me provided everything that I've ever needed and more. Mm. I've uh, read many of your books, Jen. I've just got a, a couple here. Um, uh, a Year's Journey with God. My wife, Killy, and I have loved this. One year we went through it and bite-size encouragement. Um, I find, uh, I, as I've read several of your books, you talk a lot about forgiveness. Wow, yes. That's the whole thing. That journey of forgiveness I had to go through with my husband was huge. 
and incredibly painful because I'd actually already written a book on forgiveness. Yes. And I thought I knew everything about the subject, but you see, it's much more difficult to do it than to write about it or preach about it, for that matter. It's desperately difficult. Yes. So how did you eventually forgive your husband and maybe others? How did you do it? Well, with my husband, I do remember feeling, first of all, not, not angry at all. The poor chap. I was probably a horrible wife, you know. I wasn't angry with the other lady because she was a very sweet lady. Stupid poppycock. Because inside, of course, we're angry furious but we're Christians we mustn't be angry so after a while it began to dawn on me just how angry I was and that had to be dealt with I had to write a long long letter of saying all the things that I had felt that God had let me down and Tony had let me down and I had to go and, and, and throw that over a cliff bound up round a stone felt good but it does help to do something practical like that definite flush it down the toilet or set fire to it if it's a letter helps a lot yeah and don't allow it to hinder your future but it comes back you can do all those good things and the next day you're remembering all the bad things and you're just as angry but you see it's a process you have to do it almost several times a day really to choose to forgive and let go of it it happens over and over again i still have to do it now when i think of him hmm. yeah you're currently facing another battle yes yes very different tell us about that well i've recently discovered that i have lung cancer which is pretty mean seeing i never smoked yeah but it was quite a shock, you know? Of course, I know that, that Jesus could heal me. I mean, I know it better than most people would know. I could. But I have that conviction that this is the time when he wants me home. And this is not the right time for me to ask that question. And I've suddenly realized that life is all about not down here at all. Life's all about the next bit, the gorgeous bit. Jesus talked a lot about that gorgeous bit and it's going to be beautiful and simply I can't wait. I I'm not afraid of death, I think because years ago when I was first very ill with encephalitis, I had a, a near-death experience. It's changed everything. I was very, very ill in hospital. All the drips and drains and bleepy machines all around my cot, because in a cot, and my minister from my church came to pray for me. I could see him through the cot bars. And as he prayed, I just felt I was lifting off the bed. It was like there was a, a tunnel in the wall in front of me, and I was lifting up and out. And I wasn't scared. It was beautiful. It was painless. It was lovely. I left all the pain behind on that bed. And I thought, I'm going to see the Lord. He'll, I know what he'll look like. And I did get there. I got to a beautiful place. I don't think I felt I was inside. I was sort of on the threshold. The colours, I can't describe. There are no words in any language to describe the colours and the peace of it the loveliness of it. And I felt that he was asking me, do you want to come in or go back? And of course I wanted to come in. It was beautiful. But then I seemed to see my six children, only little, way back in the dark down there, and my husband. I thought I, I must go back. So he let me come back, said it would be tough, and by gum it has been. But I came back into the bed and all the bleepers were bleeping and nurses were running around and doctors and horrible things. And it was in the pain again. How oh, I have regretted that decision ever since. But I know I'm not going to be scared the next time. And I would love to say to anyone who's actually facing death now or 
you've lost somebody or you're going to lose someone and you're frightened about it, don't be. Actually, dying is delightful and there's, it's real. Heaven is real and it's so beautiful you can't even describe it. I can't wait to get there. Don't be frightened. You're okay. If you know him, if you've given your life over to him and he's taken away the things that you regret, you'll be there and I'll see you there. God bless you. That's beautiful, Jen. If there's anyone that's listening in now and they don't have assurance of knowing Jesus and knowing they have a hope for the future. Would you lead them in a, a prayer, well, Jen? I'd, I'd love to do that. Thank you. And it is difficult. When you get something like cancer, all those doubts do come back and you think, what is going to happen to me? I'm falling over a cliff. And it'll all be dark. No, it won't be. I'd love to pray for you. Supposing you really do want to know Jesus, but you've never quite known how to do it. I'll just lead you in a little prayer. You could say it with me. Lord Jesus, I'm beginning to know you're real. I'm beginning to know that you love me. But I am sorry for all those things I've done by mistake or deliberately that's hurt people. Please, will you wash those away? Well, please, will you just come right into my heart now and fill me up with yourself and take away my fears. Will you come and fetch me when that moment comes, Lord? Thank you. Amen. 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 Amen, Jen. So until the Lord takes you and promotes you to glory, you, you, you're ministering. Yes, I'd and, love to tell people that story. Yes. <laughs> and and teaching and praying for people. Yes. yes. And that's I been love doing that. your life for, for many years. Yep. yep. Keep on till I finish. <laughs> you're an absolute inspiration, Jen. Thank you so much for joining us on Facing the Canon. Thank you for having me. Bless you. <laughs> I hope that has, has inspired you. It's warmed my heart. So many of Jen's books are so helpful. Uh, I've given away so many of these to neighbours and so many people who uh, are bereaved and struggling. Beautiful gems of wisdom to infuse in people faith, hope and love. And I hope and pray that you've been infused with a little of that today. Thank you so much for joining us on Facing the Canon. Please join us again.